in our headlines on this Tuesday afternoon, June 25th, here on the Korean Peninsula. A deadly blaze at a lithium battery plant back on Monday kills 23 workers, mostly Chinese migrants here in Korea. Authorities have yet to determine the cause of the fire. And North Korea resumes its floating of waste carrying balloons into South Korea Monday night and some 100 balloons have landed here mostly in the greater Seoul area. Meanwhile, the U.S. State Department returns South Korea to its list of top-tier countries and territories that satisfy standards for the elimination of human trafficking. Investigations are underway to determine the cause of the brutal blaze that killed and injured at least 30 workers at a lithium battery plant in Hwasong City, Gyeonggi-do province, earlier on Monday. Our Kim bo -gyang has the latest. Police and fire authorities began a joint investigation at around noon on Tuesday into one of the worst accidents to occur at a chemical factory in the country. It involves around 40 people from nine agencies, including the Gyeonggi Nambu Provincial Police, which oversees Hwasong, along with fire authorities, the National Forensic Service and other relevant organizations to determine the exact cause of the fire. A fire broke out at a lithium primary battery plant run by Aricel on Monday, leaving at least 23 workers dead. The first blaze broke out on the second floor of the number 3 building at 10.31 a.m. and was completely extinguished approximately 22 hours later at 8.48 a.m. on Tuesday. A level 2 emergency response previously issued by fire authorities to ask for support from 8 to 14 fire stations was downgraded to level 1 at 9.51 p.m. on Monday night and was lifted three hours later at 12.42 a.m. At least 23 people lost their lives. They include 17 Chinese nationals, one person from Laos, and five Koreans. Authorities had originally reported that 18 Chinese nationals had died, but one person has been since identified as a Korean national. One foreigner had been missing, but with one dead body found at around 11.34 a.m. Tuesday, authorities are assuming this is that missing person. Their identity is not yet known. Only the identities of two Koreans have been discovered, a man in his 50s and the other who has been identified through fingerprinting on Tuesday morning, originally a Chinese national in his 40s, who naturalized to Korea. Meanwhile, eight people were injured and two are reportedly seriously injured. President Yoon Seok-yeol visited the site of the fire on Monday afternoon, conveying his condolences and urging fire authorities to thoroughly investigate the cause. The Chinese ambassador to South Korea, Shin Haimi, also visited the site. Kim bo -kyung, Arirang News. Meanwhile, North Korea appears to have resumed its floating of waste carrying balloons into South Korea. Some 100 balloons have landed here overnight, mostly in the Greater Seoul area. Our correspondent Kim Jong Shil has more. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said as of 9 a.m. Tuesday, around 350 balloons that were launched from the north on Monday night had been identified and that about 100 of them had landed in South Korean territory. The military said most of them landed in Seoul and the northern regions of Gyeonggi-do province. The trash being carried by the balloons is mostly paper and no harmful substances have been found. The military added that it is ready to begin propaganda broadcasts aimed at North Korea, depending on the regime's actions. Our military is ready to implement a loudspeaker broadcast against the North immediately. We will be strategic and flexible with the situation and will begin when the instruction is given. North Korea already sent trash-carrying balloons on four occasions between May 28th and June 10th. South Korea's Ministry of Unification provided some information about those balloons. The majority of the trash was cut off waste paper, plastic and clothing scraps that seemed to have been put together for the purpose of sending, rather than regular household trash. There were also parasites found in the soil included in the trash. The ministry added that the parasites may have come from human waste while adding that there was no risk of contamination or infection. While most were carrying planned trash made for balloons, the ministry said there was also trash that may indicate the poor economic condition in the north, such as old, worn-out socks, gloves and T-shirts. 
Monday's balloon launch is believed to be in retaliation for the 300,000 leaflets sent by a North Korean defector organization last Thursday. Fighters for a Free North Korea, a civic group, sent dartle bills, leaflets, and USBs containing South Korean dramas and songs. North Korean leader's sister Kim Yo-jong has previously warned of sending more trash balloons regarding the leaflets sent by North Korean defector organization in the South. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. South Korea is prepared to respond overwhelmingly and decisively to any provocation by North Korea. Intentions to this end were reiterated by President Yoon se earlier on this Tuesday to mark the 74th anniversary of the tragic beginning of the Korean War when North Korean tanks crossed the 38th parallel into South Korea. President Yoon also took the occasion to denounce North Korea's latest floating of waste-carrying balloons into South Korea and the regime's recent military pact with Russia. Emphasizing the presence of peace through power, he highlighted South Korea's firm security posture and its alliance with like-minded partners to further promote global peace and freedom. The Washington Declaration signed by South Korea and the U.S. last year could serve as deterrence amid concerns of a defense deal recently sealed by North Korea and Russia. Remarks to this end were shared by U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Kurt Campbell earlier on Monday. Under the Washington Declaration, Seoul and Washington saw the establishment of a joint nuclear consultative group and a U.S. pledge to bolster the visibility of strategic military assets on the Korean Peninsula. Regional security concerns have been mounting in light of a recent pact between Pyongyang and Moscow that pledges immediate military assistance in the event of an armed aggression against the other. And speaking of bolstering the visibility of strategic U.S. military assets here, the Ghost Rider is in South Korea in a show of strength amid tensions with North Korea. Our defense correspondent Chemin Min Jung reports from the Osan Air Base. The heavily armed U.S. AC-130J aircraft made a second visit to South Korea earlier this month. For the occasion, U.S. Forces Korea Monday held a special press conference at the Osan Air Base in the city of Pyeongtaek, providing a closer look at the gunship, also known as the Ghost Rider. As you can see behind me, the Ghost Rider is a key U.S. military asset and remains one of the most requested aircraft by ground forces. The AC-130J is a traditional C-130J cargo aircraft modified with an array of sensors and weapons. Its primary missions are close air support, air interdiction, and armed reconnaissance. The Ghost Rider can be armed with 30mm and 105mm cannons and fire precision-guided weapons. When you pair all of those weapons with the constant left-hand turn that a gunship is known for flying, our weapons are continuously pointed in the direction of any potential targets. Simply put, the speed at which we can engage rounds on target less than 30 seconds, that is unmatched by any aircraft in the world. That allows us to deliver rapid, persistent, and accurate fire support that is very unique to the gunship. The Ghost Rider was first and last deployed to South Korea in March last year for live fire exercises. And last week, South Korean and U.S. forces conducted their second joint drills over the Korean Peninsula involving the aircraft. We've not forgotten our commitment to the ironclad alliance to defend our homelands, a commitment born out of the blood and 70 years uh, of working together to ensure a safe and peaceful peninsula. Since then, we've steadfastly maintained a deterrence posture with a credible special operations force to prevent conflict while also giving senior leaders options and the knowledge that we will prevail if needed. The U.S. gunship arrived approximately two weeks ago and is set to depart later this week after conducting additional training events. The drills involving the Ghost Rider come amid escalating tensions on the Korean Peninsula following deepening military cooperation between North Korea and Russia. Choi min Jung, Arirang News, Pyeongtaek. Also in the news, South Korea returns to a U.S. list of top-tier countries in the combat against human trafficking. Our Lee Sing jae has details. The U.S. State Department on Monday released its 2024 Trafficking in Persons Report. 
The annual report breaks down the list of countries that meet standards for the elimination of human trafficking across three tiers, with South Korea returning to the highest tier, Tier 1 category, alongside the U.S., Britain, Taiwan, France and Singapore. Countries and territories whose governments fully meet the Trafficking Victims Protection Act's minimum standards for the elimination of trafficking are included in Tier 1. South Korea was placed into Tier 2 in the 2022 report for the first time in 20 years, but returned to the top tier after two years. According to the report, South Korea was placed in the top tier as the government of the Republic of Korea fully meets the minimum standards for the elimination of trafficking, citing key achievements by the government in doing so. The report said South Korea had increased trafficking investigations, prosecuted and convicted more people guilty of trafficking, implemented the Victim Identification Index, and identified 55 trafficking victims during the report's one-year period, among others. However, the report also said that the South Korean government did not proactively investigate labor trafficking cases and its victim identification index did not contain sufficient measures to screen for labor trafficking. It also mentioned other issues, including not having prosecuted a case involving human trafficking in the distant water fishing sector. Still, Seoul's foreign ministry on Tuesday praised the return to the top tier list, stressing that it's the result of efforts that the government has made to faithfully respond to trafficking issues and protect victims in line with relevant domestic laws. Meanwhile, North Korea has been placed into the lowest tier 3 list for the 22nd straight year. Also included in the list are China, Russia and Iran. The annual U.S. report measures efforts to eliminate trafficking in 188 countries and territories, with this reporting period from April 1st last year through March 31st. Lee seung Arirang News. In other news, Korean consumers believe the inflation will hover on the 3% range over the next 12 months here in the country. Now, this is according to findings by the Bank of Korea on this Tuesday, with officials there adding that the outlook falls short of their target range of 2%. Still, this latest projection by the public here is down 0.2 percentage points on month. The BOK, for its part, points out local inflation remains vulnerable to external variables such as oil prices and interest rates. Incheon City is hosting a forum to share prospects of innovation from the perspective of the public sector amid a host of global concerns. Our Shin Hyung was there. The 2024 United Nations Public Service Forum, co-organized by South Korea's Minister of the Interior and Safety and the UN, opened on Monday in Songdo, Incheon. Under the theme Fostering Innovation Amid Global Challenges, a Public Sector Perspective, the event brings together 2,000 participants from over 100 countries to discuss key issues in public service. The forum is the most prestigious international event in the public service sector. It is expected to help promote Korea's outstanding digital companies worldwide and expand their opportunities for going global. During a keynote speech, former U.S. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon addressed international solidarity for achieving the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. But our world, as well as the technological advancement that power it, is vastly different than it was in 2015 when the UN SDGs were adopted. Thus, public institutions and officials must keep pace with the such changes and advance sustainable solutions in a more innovative Taking part in this year's plenary session, the Digital Technologies Minister of Uzbekistan, next year's host country, emphasized the importance of governments understanding their mission when integrating AI in public services. He added that Uzbekistan and South Korea have a long-standing cooperation in terms of e-government. This uh, long-standing cooperation really helped us to improve the uh, our uh, views as well as our approaches to e-government implementation in Uzbekistan. We were in constant discussion in terms of reviewing the methodologies, learning from uh, Korean government as well. From the infrastructure point of view, we are already cooperating with uh, South Korea 
uh, on uh, making uh, on increasing our data center capabilities. We are also the event also features an exhibition showcasing innovative public services. And one of them is South Korea's digital platform government, which uses digital technologies like AI to provide services tailored to people's needs. Korea is uh, considered one of the uh, leading countries uh, in government innovation, including uh, digital governments, and has successfully shared examples of outstanding policies with all UN member states. The main contents of the exhibition include the background and basic principles of the digital platform government, a zero required document system, and national secretary program, and CCTV a traffic volume analysis, you name it. The three-day event will wrap up on Wednesday with the UN Public Service Awards Ceremony, where 15 innovative achievements by public service institutions will be recognized. Shin Ha-yong, Arirang News. Also on the local front, an annual cultural forum this year placed much emphasis on enhancing broader communication of Korea's flavors, language and styles. Our An Song Jin covers the event. In the coming years, how will South Korea be seen by the rest of the world? With Hallyu, or the Korean wave, spreading around the globe more and more, the cultural elements of it are becoming more widely known, including food. Mandu and kimbap are becoming more familiar to the world and more people are being exposed to Korean dramas and movies. As Korean content, food and beauty are becoming disseminated globally, as well as the Korean lifestyle, it has become crucial to properly share our culture for people to understand it. Under the theme New Korea, the Korea Image Communication Institute this week held its 15th annual Culture Communication Forum. Only this year, it included an ideas contest, as well as AI-made images that best represent Korea. I think South Korea will be a country where new cultures overseas audition, meaning that I'm sure Korean culture will play a leading role in the world. Fifteen final contestants out of the 256 projects submitted were showcased on the day, and six were selected through a vote. First place for the most well-represented idea of Korea awards went to a calligrapher who incorporated the Korean writing system, Hangul, into their idea, suggesting the creation of a landmark statue to represent the beauty of the letters. Meanwhile, an AI image created by a university student that illustrated the contrast yet harmony of the Korean traditional clothing hanbok with modern elements won first place in the AI image category. The forum also provided a platform to explore the future of Korean representation with cultural leaders around the world. There are more and more young French that are fascinated by K-culture. They are learning Korean language. They are looking for any opportunity to discover the country be it for studies or for tourism. Our French community here in Korea is growing by the day. With more of the success of Korean culture being witnessed over the past decade, the CICI aims to provide a blueprint that can further promote various components of the country. An Song Jin, Arirang News. Let's take a look at the latest news in the world now. The Kremlin on Monday warned of consequences following Sunday's missile strikes on Sevastopol in occupied Crimea by Ukraine, which left four dead and some 150 injured. The Kremlin also blamed the U.S. for supplying advanced missiles to Ukraine, accusing the U.S. of killing Russian children. Sunday's attack was also described as being absolutely barbaric. The Russian Foreign Ministry on Monday summoned the American ambassador to Moscow to protest Ukraine's use of U.S.-made Atacams missiles, saying that retaliatory measures will certainly follow. Russia's Defense Ministry on Sunday claimed that all Atacams missiles are programmed by American specialists and guided by U.S. satellites. Moving over to India, a Delhi city minister is in the midst of a hunger strike to demand more drinking water in the country's capital, where taps are running nearly dry in its poorest neighborhoods amid scorching summer heat waves. Delhi Water Minister Atishi Malena Singh entered day four of the strike on Monday. She said that there are 2.8 million people in the city who are aching for just a drop of water. 
Atishi also said that Delhi is suffering from a shortage because the government of the neighboring state of Haryana has been supplying 100 million gallons of water per day less to Delhi for the last three weeks. The majority of Delhi's water supply relies on the Yamuna River that runs through the country's capital. However, during dry summer months, the river slows down, causing shortages that has led to protests before. Now to the U.S. where a lawsuit was filed by a civil liberties group against the state of Louisiana on Monday over a new law requiring the Christian Ten Commandments to be displayed in public school classrooms. Nine families with children in the state's public schools filed a lawsuit in the Louisiana federal court saying the law violates the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which calls for the separation of church and state. Included in the lawsuit are plaintiffs representing a variety of religious beliefs who worry the law interferes with their children's religious freedom, while the group's lawyer says it pressures parents and children to accept the state's favored religious agenda. Louisiana became the only state in the U.S. to require the display of the Ten Commandments in public school classrooms on June 19th. Lastly, to winter season Chile, Chilean authorities began a rescue mission on Sunday in the central Cajon del Maipo Canyon, where heavy snow avalanches cut off the majority of the roads in the region. The provincial chief of Chile's national police said that 33 people were left isolated and trapped at the Lagunillas ski center, including eight children. In the region metropolitana of central Chile, avalanches left 29 people stranded as the snow blocked an access road in the mountains. Alejandra Cortes, a federal government delegate to Cordillera province, said that the authorities are doing everything possible to save people who are trapped, while adding that they may attempt to set off a controlled avalanche to clear the snow if required. Kim Xiong, Arirang News. Good afternoon. Sun safety is a must today with parts of Jeollanam-do and Gyeongsang-do provinces seeing UV rays soaring to extreme levels during the day. Please stay out of the sun during the hottest and sunniest parts of the day. But the heat will not be too strong with temperatures hovering right around the norms. Seoul and Chuncheon will be going up to 27 degrees, Gwangju, Daejeon at 28 degrees. Sunny skies will beam down nationwide except on Jeju where cloudy skies will cover the island before another monsoon front arrives early tomorrow. The island will receive downpours again, getting more than 150 millimeters through Thursday. The south coast could also see up to 60 millimeters of heavy showers. Meanwhile, central regions stay sunny and hot through the rest of the week with higher humidity. And by Friday, Seoul will get up to 33 degrees Celsius. Then weekend rain will put the brakes on warming trend. With that in mind, let's take a look at the international weather conditions. Those are the headlines at this hour here in Korea. Coming up next is our daily panel session, so do stay with us. Thank you for now.